Hello, my name is Katalin and you are listening to my Wellness Workshop Radio. Today I'm really excited that we have Paul Gemini, the author of the Perfect Health Diet book on the show. This book is an excellent source of reliable and credible information about nutrition, diet, wellness, lifestyle and overcoming chronic diseases. So Dr. Gemini and his wife are both scientists with long-standing interest in diet and health. Dr. Jamine is an astrophysicist who put his scientific mind to work in the paleo community. He has a fascinating healing story that I will ask him to tell you about. So with his wife, they have collaborated for many years on their book on what they say is the perfect diet for optimum health. It is a paleo-based diet, but it's modified based upon their extensive research and dietary knowledge. This book is actually also available in Hungarian translation, so I had the privilege to first read his book in Hungarian, which is my native language. So before we get started, let me introduce myself a little bit too. So I'm an economist turned functional diagnostic nutritionist and founder of my wellness workshop. So with the help of these expert interviews, my goal is to provide help for people repairing health and building wellness with natural approaches and to help them find and address the root causes behind their health conditions. I'm, local, I'm also local chapter leader of the Western A. Price Nutrition Education Foundation, as well as a member in the international team of Paleo Convention Berlin that is coming up on the 25th of July in Germany, Berlin. It is going to be the biggest paleo event in Europe with paleo food market, expert symposium, food and exercise workshops and more. So if you haven't done it yet, book your tickets at paleoconvention.de because tickets are actually going very fast. So I'm going to provide the, the link for this event in the show notes. Our today guest, Paul Gemine, is also coming to Berlin to the paleo convention as one of the international speakers on the symposium. So, Dr. Jamine, Paul, welcome to the show. Uh, Hi, Catalin. It's great to be speaking with you. Thank you. So, why don't you first tell the listeners uh, how you went from astrophysics to developing the perfect health diet. So, what is your story? Well, it was really about our personal health, uh, my wife and I. Mm -hmm. And so, I had had... uh, you know, some health issues my whole life. Uh, So actually my mother was diagnosed with cancer while she was pregnant with me and my twin sister. And and I had uh, chronic ear infections as a young child and I was in and out of the hospital and had had, uh, a couple of surgeries uh, by age four. And, um, uh, And then as a teenager I developed very severe acne and it it stuck around. I still had it in my late twenties, and at that time, I decided to get medical treatment for it. And so, uh, I first was on a year of antibiotics, and then uh, took Accutane. And uh, and while I, while I was on antibiotics, uh, my health just started going downhill, and uh, I didn't really realize at the time that it was due to the antibiotics. Um, and what I later figured out is that. My early childhood ear infections were fungal infections, and then I had chronic fungal infections, and when I took the antibiotics, then uh, it got much more severe. Um, But at the time, I really didn't know what was going on, and I would, you know, go to the doctor and and talk about it, and he would just dismiss uh, my concerns. But I noticed while I was on the antibiotics, I uh, I was a runner, and my running speed kept slowing down. And... You know, by the time I had been on antibiotics a year, I was getting passed by seventy-year-old ladies when I would go out to run. <laughs> and, uh, and anyhow, and then um, I, I eventually, you know, I got off the antibiotics, but uh, my health kept getting worse. And you know, I was always very busy. I was a scientist, and then I became a software entrepreneur. And so I was always working sixty, seventy-hour weeks, and I was eating, you know, just very convenient food. I ate a lot of. Uh, Coca-Cola no. and, uh, and bread and cheese, uh, you know, so things that were, you could just go in the store, get, you know, a loaf of bread and some cheese and, you know, buy a, a bottle of, of soda and, uh, you know, you'd have a very quick meal, but it wasn't very nourishing. Yeah. And, uh, and I started getting, you know, more and more health issues and uh, the things that really bothered me uh, and made me concerned uh, eventually. It took about 15 years for 
you know, things getting steadily worse and not getting help from doctors. Uh, but I started to have neurological issues, uh, memory loss, um, tremor, um, and my balance was very poor. I'd be dropping things, bumping into things. My reaction time was very slow. Uh, you know, but the worst was the memory loss. It was affecting my ability to work. Yeah, and, that's pretty scary. Uh, yeah, so, um, you know, so I, I started getting really worried, and I was casting about uh, for things that might help. And I came across the, uh, I started to realize the diet might be important, and then I came across the paleo diet. And this was in 2005, and it sounded, it sounded plausible, and so I decided to give it a try. And it was really the first thing I tried that made a big difference in how I felt. Uh, but some of the things, some of the things that happened made me feel worse. <laughs> hmm. And uh, uh, and so that started us on a, you know, so in, in some ways I got better, in some ways I got worse. But uh, it was really exciting to have found something that mattered. All right, because nothing the doctors had done it had made a difference. And so then um, I realized, all right. I, I have to figure this out. You know, I'm I'm too young to be having these symptoms, and you know, here I found I I've proven that diet is important, and I just have to figure out the right diet. So clearly, you know, the way I'd implemented paleo wasn't perfect, uh, and I should, you know, figure out how to fix it. Mm. And so that was that was what got us started, and it took about five years of research and personal experimentation uh, to figure out a better approach, and and that was the perfect health diet. Okay. And so then we published our, we knew, you know, we, we figured a lot of things out and we knew it would help a lot of people. So we felt an obligation to write it up in a book and, and we did. And everything has just grown from there. Oh, yeah. So how good that is uh, that you dove into, uh, into the research and figured it out for yourself. And now you are sharing it and you have been sharing it for, for others' benefit. So... You actually mentioned that the perfect health diet is kind of similar to the paleo diet because this was your like starting point. Uh, and in your book, book, you talk about the evolutionary approach to diet. So what is this evolutionary approach and why is it important to understand evolution and like the biology of food and how does it lead to the concept of, of a balanced diet for optimal health in, in your understanding? Yeah, well, I, I guess I'd start by saying what, what hasn't worked and, you know, what hasn't helped us figure out the optimal diet. And that's the way that conventional nutritionists and dietitians uh, approach things. Yeah. And so the way, the way they've done things is they had, this, they had this picture of how science should work, and they figured it should work through observation and experiment. All right, so observation is, you know, sciences like astronomy or, or yours, economics, where people observe how things work and they try to uh, infer, uh, you know, what's going on. Uh, and then experiments, experimental science, you conduct an experiment. And, and in nutrition, uh, the experiments would be clinical trials and the observations would be epidemiology. You observe how people eat and you see which people are healthy and you try and go back and figure out which diets are healthy. And uh, those things have, have not worked, and, and dietitians and nutritionists have not been able to figure out what the right diet is from those. And the reason is, uh, basically, the, cl the clinical trials are too short. You know, you can't really take people and put them in a lab and feed them a specific diet for 70 years uh, and, uh, you know, see how they turn out. Uh, you know, at least since we outlawed slavery, you can't do that. And um, <laughs> so, um, you know, but that's what, we concern, what we're concerned about. You know, the imperfect diets that people actually eat, you know, they allow people to live to age 80. So, you know, in order to make a better diet, you may have to observe people for 80, 85, 90 years in order to prove that, you know, the diet really is better and will enable people to live longer. Uh, and you, you just can't, you know, clinical trials, you can do them for a few weeks, you know, maybe a few months at most if it's a small number of people. And basically those are only, the only things clinical trials have been able to discover are the really acute nutritional deficiency diseases, things like beriberi, pellagra, scurvy, rickets. You know, they've been able to um, associate those. Each of those are fatal diseases that can appear in a matter of months uh, from missing a single ingredient. So you just take the ingredient out, put it back in, and you can see results pretty quickly. 
Um, and then observations, the problem with those is that everybody around the world eats almost the same diet. You know, in Asia, they'll eat rice. In Europe, they'll eat wheat. But, uh, you know, if you compare them, they're eating similar amount of starch. And uh, so there really isn't that much dietary variation around the world. And the reason for that is an evolutionary one. Our, you know, our brains have been programmed to seek uh, certain types of food. And so everybody follows those evolution and those evolved impulses, and you don't really see much variety. Uh, and what variety you do see is highly correlated with income. You know, so richer people will eat better than poorer people, uh, and they have better health. But there's lots of ways that higher income could help improve your health. So you know, we don't really know that it's through diet. Everything is correlated. Yeah. Uh, so uh, there's just no way to figure out from either observations or experiments what the best diet is. And uh, so what we did was a totally different approach. We started, you know, first of all, we just took the paleo diet as our starting point. And for us, paleo basically means a natural whole foods diet. You know, so what could people, what kind of foods could people obtain in the paleolithic? You know, they could uh, hunt animals and they could gather plants. And, you know, so uh, natural whole foods means you know, recently living plants and animals that you could hunt and gather. Uh, and, uh, you know, and so basically I'd say any natural whole foods diet is a possible paleolithic diet. So I wouldn't say that uh, paleolithic diets necessarily need to have a specific uh, amount of plants or animals or specific types of, of foods. Um, and then what we wanted to do was figure out how to optimize a paleolithic type diet, hunter-gatherer type diet, uh, in terms of nutrition. And so we looked into the literature for every known nutrient and tried to figure out what the optimal amount of that nutrient to get in your diet is. And then when we had that, work back and figure out a mix of foods that would give the optimum amount of every nutrient. Okay. And so that's what we did to generate the perfect health diet. And then once we had it, you know, then we looked, looked back and said, oh, there was another way we could have figured this out. Uh, there were all these evolutionary uh, uh, selection arguments that would have pointed us to what the optimal diet is. And we give about five different uh, arguments in the beginning of our book. You know, things like the composition of breast milk and the composition of our bodies. You know, how does our body generate energy when we're fasting? Uh, it does it by cannibalizing our own, our own bodies, and, uh, and that gives us a, a set of nutrients that can uh, maintain the function of our bodies because fasting is a very natural process. Um, and, then, uh, and then I mentioned our appetites. You know, our brain has evolved a preference for certain things, and if, if you eat an unbalanced diet, uh, then people will often develop cravings for the things that are missing. You know, so my wife used to have a real craving for crabs and other seafood because she was iodine deficient. Mm. And when she finally started uh, supplementing iodine, then her desire for crabs went away and, and shellfish. Um, and we, we see that with a, a lot of other nutrients. When people go too low carb, they often develop a craving for sugar um, or sometimes for alcohol, and uh, which can substitute... Uh, in the brain for uh, for carbohydrate, and um, so you know, there's definitely those are very powerful influences, and um, and that's one thing that uh, uh, led us to the concept of ancestral gourmet cuisine, uh, the idea that you know our brain evolved to like things that are good for us, and so if we put our paleolithic hunter hunted gathered foods together in the most delicious proportions, then we'll get to the optimal diet. And if we, we just follow our taste, and that means that if you design uh, food for deliciousness, you know, like gourmet food, uh, you know, then you'll, you'll be eating a very healthy diet too, as long as it's, uh, you know, a paleo uh, type diet. And so we're really excited that, uh, you know, you can eat at gourmet restaurants and be uh, perfectly healthy. Yeah, and, that sounds good. <laughs> yep, yeah. and and actually, um, 
Uh, we've just uh, partnered up with a restaurant in Dusseldorf, Germany, uh, in order to uh, you know provide perfect health diet ancestral gourmet cuisine. Uh, so it'll be a, a very nice restaurant on the Koenigs I live. Oh, that sounds very exciting. And uh, how is how is it with your plans? Like, when is the restaurant is going to open up, or is it a running? It, it's restaurant? going to open up in three days from now. So oh, uh, wow. by, by the time this podcast appears, I bet it, it will be open. Okay, so people in Düsseldorf, <laughs> go ahead and check it out. <laughs> Uh, and I believe that you know the restaurant is going to be exhibiting at the Paleo Convention. So if you come if you come to the Paleo Convention in Berlin, you can meet the uh, uh, the restaurant. Uh, yeah. Owners. Yeah, most definitely. So everyone should come and and visit us there. So and um, coming back to the to this uh, perfect health diet, when you develop this diet, you also figured uh, that uh, it would work for like all kinds of health problems because it's actually like removing most of the causes of chronic disease. So I'm, I'm all about <laughs> getting to the root and removing the, you know, the causes. So what are your thoughts on, on this and why is it that getting to the root causes of health problems and fixing things at the root is working so much better than just to deal with symptoms removal? You, you partially, you know, mentioned already this uh, traditional realm versus uh, your thinking, but I'd like you to expand on that. Yeah, well, our you know our bodies are designed to be healthy. They're self-healing. You know, we've got an immune system, and uh, and everything is designed to maintain yourself and keep yourself in good health. You know, for a period of uh, whatever eighty to one hundred and twenty years, and um, <laughs> you know, so if you're not actively causing ill health, you know, if if there isn't something that's damaging your health, like uh, some kind of infection or a bad lifestyle, a bad diet. You know, if you're starving yourself of key nutrients, then your body won't be able to maintain itself and, and you'll have ill health. Uh, you know, but if you're not exposed to any of those causes of ill health, then you'll naturally just have very good health. And, uh, and even if you've been damaging yourself, if you, if you start removing the causes of ill health, uh, then your body will get stronger and its ability to heal itself will get better and your immune system will get stronger, it will be better able to deal with infections. Um, so even if, you know, if you, th so the first thing to do whenever you're unhealthy is tend to your diet, tend to your nutrition, tend to your lifestyle. So lifestyle has a really big health impact and you really want to live in what we call an, an ancestral way uh, in conformity with uh, how our Paleolithic ancestors would have lived, how animals live, uh, you know, in a very natural way, you know, getting exercise, getting sunshine in the daytime, uh, you know, getting a good night's sleep, um, and, uh, you know, eating uh, a natural ancestral diet um, that's, that's balanced and, and nourishing. You know, if you, if you do all those things, then most diseases will resolve spontaneously. Yeah, so there is a lot more to health than, than uh, diet only. But uh, once we are talking ab about balanced diet, you, you made a very nice like, visual illustration of how a balanced diet, balanced diet looks like in your understanding. So, and this chart looks like an apple. Yeah, that's and right. It's, um, <laughs> so it's in the shape of an apple, yeah. uh, but it also has uh, the yin-yang symbol. Uh, from, mm -hmm. from China on yeah. it, and my wife is Chinese, mm -hmm. uh, of Chinese ancestry, and, um, and the yin-yang symbol symbolizes balance, and for us one of the motivations was balance between plant and animal food, uh, and so the paleo movement had gotten a little, a little too far on the animal side, and, and in terms, and uh, a little too much in love with low-carb eating. Yeah. And um, a lot of the paleo diets at the time we published our book excluded starches, you know, so they excluded things like, like potatoes uh, mm -hmm. and a lot of tubers, which are very healthy foods. And, uh, you know, so we, uh, it's important actually to bring those back and include those in your diet. Yeah, and, so. uh, yep, yeah, so um, balance between plant and animal foods was important. And, uh, um, and in general, you know, like I said, the way we developed our diet was by looking at all the known nutrients and trying to optimize all of them at the same time. 
so neither too much nor too little of any one thing. And, you know, that's, we think, is the definition of balance. You know, what's a balanced diet? You're getting everything in the right proportions. Uh, you know, so if you eat an unbalanced diet, you're getting too much of one thing, too little of another. Uh, and because our diet was designed from the beginning to be, to be balanced, um, we wanted to have a symbol of balance, like the, the yin-yang symbol in our, uh, in our food plate. Yeah, this chart is very impressive as of the, you know, visual elements of it and also as of the contents of it. And you mentioned safe starches. Safe starches. So, um, uh, first of all, what are starches and why some starches are safe and some are not? And how, how is this all about starches according yeah. to your research? Yeah, well, uh, starchy plants, first of all, they're really important for our health. And there's several reasons for that. So, you know, one is that uh, the digestible part of starch, uh, starch digests to glucose only. Um, other plants uh, that aren't starchy tend to be uh, sugary, and they tend to di digest half to glucose, half to fructose. And we need a lot more glucose than fructose. And if you eat too much fructose, then it starts being malabsorbed, and, uh, and it's left for gut bacteria. And having a lot of fructose in your gut can lead to small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and other problems. Um, so uh, it's important to get enough carbs, uh, but you should get carbs mainly from glucose, and that means you need to eat some starches if you're, if you're getting your carbs from natural whole foods. Um, so that's one thing. And then it turns out um, starchy plants have a lot of fiber of a certain type called resistant starch. Yeah. Um, especially if you cook them and then cool them, you know, let them refrigerate them for a day or two. Uh, and resistant starch turns out to be really beneficial. Uh, so we want to have a diversity of fiber sources, uh, including fiber from fruits and vegetables. Uh, but resistant starch is kind of a unique uh, kind of fiber which complements the other, the other types. And so you definitely want to get resistant starch in your diet. And if you're not eating starchy plants, then you won't get any resistant starch fiber uh, to support a good gut microbiome. Um, so those two things, even apart from the other nutrients that are in starchy plants, you know, like potassium and, uh, and other micronutrients, um, it's still, uh, you know, just the starch itself is nutritious uh, mm -hmm. by providing glucose and resistant starch fiber. Um, so starches are a really important part of your diet. And then, uh, you know, but we also uh, agreed with some of the concerns of the paleo diet about uh, the healthfulness of starchy plants. And the, basically the reason we're concerned is that uh, the cereal grains and uh, most of the legumes, uh, they're special in that they evolved in grasslands. Um, and grasslands and mammals co-evolved. So uh, if you think of grasslands, they can't really survive unless there are herbivorous mammals like horses or cows or zebras or buffalo um, that are grazing. And the, the grazing mammals basically uh, kill all the saplings, all the trees that may come up. Okay. And if trees grow, then the shade kills the grasses. Uh, and so then you stop having a grassland, you start having a forest. And, um, you know, so the way it could get started, you could have a forest fire that kills all the trees, and then the grasses start growing, and then the grazing animals eat the saplings and prevent the forest from growing back. Mm -hmm. And, um, but what happens then is that all these uh, grass plants uh, they have their seeds above ground, and the seeds are getting eaten by all the grazing mammals. And, you know, plants, they don't want their seeds to get eaten. They want to be able to reproduce. And they really love the idea of the seeds coming out in manure, out the back end of the animal, so they get fertilizer along with the seeds hmm. uh, <laughs> yeah. in order to grow new plants. And in order to make that happen, they don't want the seeds to get digested. And so uh, the seeds of uh, of grasses uh, and legumes uh, have evolved a lot of compounds that suppress digestion and they sabotage the functioning of our digestive tracts. And for some of, for some of those plants, uh, cooking will destroy all of those compounds. 
And so we call those safe starches. So things like white rice um, is one of the above ground plants that becomes safe with cooking. Uh, and then most of the below ground plants, which the uh, cows and so on weren't grazing on, uh, are safe. Mm -hmm. You know, so things like potatoes. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, but some of them, uh, the, the toxins, uh, we think survive cooking and we think it's probably best to avoid them. So those would be the grains and legumes, right? Uh, like yeah, ce my... cereal grains and legumes, right? Yeah, For, yep, mm. that's right. And then the white rice is, uh, is the, the safe one that you recommend including. Yeah, and you know, probably some of the, the legumes like lentils are, are safe if you prepare them properly. Yeah. You know, so if you yeah. soak them and then cook them in a pressure cooker, uh, then they're probably also good. Yeah, we just had another podcast with Sally Fallon, founder of the Western A. Price Foundation, and we talked about the proper preparation of these legumes. So uh, coming back to white rice, actually, uh, it's, for some people it might be surprising because, you know, we heard uh, this, that, um, that if somebody is eating rice, then they should go for, you know, for the whole grain once. So yeah. why, why is that that you are recommending the white rice? Yeah, well, brown rice is, is probably okay too. And, and in a lot of cases, you know, we, we don't really know. Uh, we're guessing a little bit what the health effects of uh, uh, the uh, compounds in these, in these foods are. Um, but most of the toxins that I spoke of in cereal grains, they're in the bran. And, you know, that's the outside covering of the seed. And so when, when you eat the whole grain, you're including the bran. And, um, and in, in rice, in, in white rice, all of, we know all of the potential toxins are destroyed in cooking. In, in brown rice, not necessarily. Uh, it's, hard to, it, it's hard to destroy the compounds in the bran. Okay. And, um, you know, so it's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a judgment call. Uh, you know, but our, our judgment is, you know, we think the white rice is a little bit better uh, than the brown rice. Mm, yeah, a lot of, lots of things in nutrition are judgment calls. <laughs> so <laughs> actually, like, uh, in my opinion, also, like, carb intake is, it can be very, like, uh, personal because I don't think there is one diet that can fit all because we are all biochemically different and we have different underlying mechanisms. So it's um, a pity to say, but there is no operating man manuals to the human body and human nutrition, but still there are some general templates and guidelines which can work for everyone. And I think you made such a great job summarizing all those and you backed, up, backed it up with science and of course with evolutionary evidence. So, well, really yeah, nice. thank you very much, Catalan. I, um, I was hoping you would say that, you know, we have the operating manual for everybody, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we don't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And, uh, you know, uh, another great concept in your book that I wanted to highlight today is uh, the concept of the supplemental foods. And this is something I'm very fond of in your work because I have experience with the autoimmune version of the paleo diet and there is a huge emphasis on including supplemental foods there as well. So, uh, you know, for supercharging the healing process. So what are these supplemental foods and why are they so important? Yeah, well, that, that's, a, um, that's an important concept that uh, we introduced. And, and basically, you know, if you go back to the logic of our diet, you want to optimize every nutrient, uh, get just the right amount, not too much or too little. And when you look at certain foods that are really nutrient dense, they've got a, they've got a lot of nutrition in them, like liver or egg yolks, you know, then uh, on the one hand, they're really good things to include in your diet because they have so much nutrition uh, per calorie uh, and per the amount of food that you eat. And most people are malnourished. Most people aren't getting enough nourishment. So including the, these things is really important. But on the other hand, you know, when they have so much nutrition, it's easy to get an excess of something that they have. You know, so like liver can have a lot of iron, can have a lot of beef, can have a lot of vitamin A. And you can overdose on all of those, all right? So, um, you know, so when you're talking about the really nutrient-dense foods, you really want to get a specific amount of each one of them. And so we made specific recommendations for those nutrient-dense foods, 
uh, like we recommend uh, liver, getting about 150 grams per week, mm -hmm. uh, and egg yolks, eating three egg yolks per day. Uh, and the nice thing about, you know, following, you know, so the, the name supplemental foods was just, you know, think of these foods like supplements. You know, when we take nutritional supplements, you take a pill a day. Yeah. You know, it, it's just a habit you get into or you take a pill a week. So and it's so much better to take these from foods, from real food. Yeah. So you want to get nutrition from foods, but you also want to make them a habit and, hmm. you know, get just the right amount. And, you know, do that by um, eating a certain amount daily, like we recommend for egg yolks, or eating a certain amount weekly, like we recommend for liver. And then you'll get just the right amount of the nutrients and not too much of any. Mm -hmm. So uh, you also uh, mentioned fermented vegetables. So can someone, someone go... Uh, you know, too much of those, <laughs> or what is your recommendation? Well, you can, yeah, you can do too much of everything. Yeah. Um, so fermented vegetables. Uh, I mean, um, so you know, probably one of the bigger issues there, uh, you know, limiting uh, how much you should eat, is that when you make fermented vegetables, your um, your uh, the optimal time to start eating them is when you've. Uh, developed a lot of lactic acid producing bacteria and so the the brine that you're fermenting them in uh, acquires a lot of lactic acid and uh, lactic acid it's um, uh, it's it's not harmful in in moderation you know but it does have calories it's a calorie source and uh, you know like all empty calories you know like an oil or a sugar you know you shouldn't you shouldn't have so so much without you know, all of the other nutrients in the food. Um, you know, so all of that um, acidic water, the uh, brine that goes with the vegetables, uh, you can potentially get too much of that. Um, and then the vegetables themselves, uh, you know, it's actually, it's a very healthy uh, thing to eat. So at our health retreats, we have um, uh, health retreats in uh, mm. North Carolina on the beach. Yeah, I've heard And of that. we put out fermented vegetables at every meal. And we just encourage people to, you know, eat some, you know, mix it with their food or put it on the side and, you know, have a little bit of fermented vegetables every meal. And it's really easy to ferment them. And then once they reach the right state, keep them in the refrigerator and just, you know, serve out a, a spoonful or a serving at yeah. every meal. So they actually really work like a supplement. Yeah, it's, um, and they have a lot of nutrition you know, they, they can have beneficial bacteria for your gut, so they help diversify your, your gut flora. Um, and they also, in the fermentation, they produce various vitamins and other nutrients. Um, so most people don't get enough nucleotides in their diet. You know, that's RNA, DNA. Um, so uh, it's, it's nourishing to eat RNA and DNA and digest it to the nucleotides, and then your body can use the nucleotides to make more. RNA and DNA itself, and uh, and bacteria. You know, when you ferment things, the bacteria have a lot of DNA, and uh, and uh, you know, so you so you get that as part of your nutrition, and those are a big big component of umami flavor. Uh, so it's it's good to eat umami flavored things, which are basically fermented things. So things like uh, tamari sauce, fish sauce, uh, cheese. Um, uh, you know, other, other fermented foods yeah. uh, that bring umami flavor to your meals. Yeah, it sounds so cool, umami. <laughs> <laughs> and we are talking about DNA and stuff, so we are getting nerdy here. So for <laughs> <laughs> how about uh, like bone broth? Do you consider it also like a supplemental food or? Yeah, yes, is it yes we do. Mm -hmm. um, so really uh, what we're trying to get there is uh, what's known as extracellular matrix, you know, so to continue being nerdy. Um, yeah, I like so that. So our, our body has, you know, the scaffolds of extracellular matrix around every cell, you know, so the cells uh, live on top of the matrix and the matrix is, you know, sort of between the cells and helps support them. Um, you know, so it's sort of like in a, in a building, uh, you may have the steel frame and, uh, you know, and then you have walls and a facade, 
uh, you know, but you really need that supporting structure to give everything in shape. Yeah. And uh, the extracellular matrix is like that. And it's really crucial to how cells function. And uh, and people are only now realizing how crucial it is to maintain a healthy extracellular matrix. And like all parts of the body, it's constantly breaking down. And a lot of infections will break down extracellular matrix because they need to in order to move around the body and go infect new places. Uh, and you know, so you have a tendency to be losing it. And people don't eat enough extracellular matrix, so it's really valuable uh, to uh, make things like uh, a stock out of chicken feet or bones, joints, tendons, um, all those parts of the animal that you wouldn't normally eat because you know they're not digestible if you just eat them directly. Uh, but if you boil them for a few hours, then they'll release nutrition into the water, and then you can use the uh, that stock. And, uh, and get a lot of very valuable nutrition out of it. Yeah, and it, it, it becomes like a gel, <laughs> too. Yeah, yeah, that's right, and it's delicious. Uh, yeah, I like that, too. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and uh, talking about um, like uh, meat and protein sources, uh, what's, your, what's your intake about healthy sources? Like you, you were talking about, about this um, food chain concept in your book that you know, that humans are at the top of the food chain and at the bottom there are these green vegetables and algae. So then your holistic approach based on this food chain theory was that like humans should eat the animal protein from animals that have consumed this green food stuff. Yeah, so, so, um, so green plants, uh, they produce a lot of very valuable nutrition for us. Um, and, you know, so uh, chlorophyll is... Uh, nourishing. They, they produce a lot of other things that are nourishing, including omega-3 fats. Mm. Um, so uh, green plants like seaweed uh, and uh, green leafy vegetables are really the, you know, the fundamental source of omega-3 fats. Uh, and, then, uh, and then the other kind of starting point are seeds of various kinds, and they tend to be rich in omega-6 fats. And most people are getting too much of the omega-6 fats um, because our fruit producers really like to produce things out of seeds because they have all this uh, they have all this oil and starch so they're full of calories and people like calories whereas if you think of green leafy vegetables and seaweed there's hardly any calories mm. you know but they have lots of nutrition yeah exactly and uh, you know so in order to be well nourished we want uh, to have you know those green plants being at the base of our uh, of most of our food that we eat, and so that means uh, seafood, you know, so all of seafood is built up on eating these uh, green uh, algae seaweeds, uh, or on um, eating a good amount of uh, animals that feed on green things, and that gets back to uh, things that graze on grass, you know, like uh, the ruminants, like uh, uh, beef, lamb. Um, and then uh, the third category, major category would be the birds. And the birds eat seeds, uh, so that counts against them a little because you don't want to get too much of the omega-6 fats. Uh, but they're also uh, somewhat beneficial in, in that there's one other issue that there's some autoimmunity risk from eating things that are too closely related to us, uh, mm -hmm. eating other mammals. And so when you eat the, uh, the, the land animals like the cows and the sheep and you know, beef, lamb, uh, pork, uh, you know, then we're eating things that are relatively close to us, and there's a bit more of an autoimmunity risk. You know, so basically what happens is compounds from the food that you eat get incorporated into uh, bacteria in your digestive tract, mm -hmm. uh, and then when they're in the bacteria, they become immunogenic because our immune system is really good at recognizing bacteria and forming antibodies against the bacteria. And when you have the food compounds in there, uh, if, if the food was coming from an animal that's closely related to us, like a mammal, uh, you know, then there's a good chance that the antibodies against it may cross-react with our own uh, compounds in our body. And so there's a slightly higher autoimmunity risk when you're talking about uh, beef, lamb. And so if you get autoimmune diseases, then you'd shift more toward the birds and the seafood. Mm. Uh, and if you don't have any autoimmune issues, then uh, you should probably focus on 
you know, the red meats uh, like beef, lamb, pork, along with the seafood. Uh, so seafood is always really good. Uh, and then uh, you can choose your uh, land animals based on, uh, uh, you know, relative risk of autoimmunity. Okay, okay. It's, it's kind of a, a newer, uh, fascinating concept that uh, you just introduced <laughs> right now, as like to me, because in your book, uh, I don't remember you mentioned this uh, uh, yeah, autoimmune. Something right. it's a, a new uh, research uh, of yours, right? Yeah, that's right. So mm -hmm. okay. um, I blogged, I blogged about this uh, pretty recently, last mm. winter. Okay, all right. So it's good to know, really good to know. Uh, so like uh, for people with autoimmune diseases, they should uh, prefer more the, the birds and the, the seafood for, for their um, protein sources, right? And also like uh, it's important to get those free range chickens that, because they are also eating uh, the grass and the green stuff and the box. <laughs> Yeah, it's always desirable to eat healthy animals rather than unhealthy ones. Yeah. So, you know, whatever whatever makes an animal unhealthy causes it to be inflamed. You know, it makes an immune response. And, you know, we share a lot of the inflammatory compounds are the same between the animals and us. And mm. uh, those inflammatory uh, signaling molecules will also trigger inflammation in us, potentially. And, uh, you know, so you don't, you don't really want to eat unhealthy, inflamed animals. And it turns out when the animal is healthy, it tastes a lot better as well. So Yeah. And animals are he healthy when they are eating their, you know, their, their natural food. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And when they get, you know, sunshine and exercise. And, yeah. Uh, like those free-range stuff and grass-fed and things like that. Right. Yeah. Okay. So how about fat? I, I love to talk about fats because this is one of the most controversial topics in the world of nutrition still to date. So can you talk about some facts according to your research regarding fats? Yeah, well, it's, you know, it's like every other nutrient. You can get too little or too much. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the mainstream advice uh, was for a long time advising you to get too little. You know, so like we, rec we recommend eating three egg yolks a day. Uh, because the, you know, if, if you think of an egg, it's, uh, you know, it has to be very nourishing because it, you know, has to nourish the, you know, the chicken or other bird as it grows uh, in the egg. And, you know, so it's very nourishing for us, uh, you know, but people got scared of fat and recommended avoiding it. And so you, you started having people just eat the egg whites and throw out the yolks, which yeah. is uh, a very bad idea. Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, so people got uh, too worried about fat. Uh, and then in the paleo movement, you know, where low carb became very popular, you know, some people became a little over enamored of, of fat and started overeating it. And, uh, you know, so we have the things like bulletproof coffee where people put many tablespoons of oil in their, in their coffee. Um, yeah. And we, uh, have people eating ketogenic diets with lots of extra oil. And uh, my friend Seth Roberts, a uh, very interesting guy uh, and uh, iconoclastic, he, uh, he really loved being different uh, from other people and finding new surprising things. Okay. And he did a lot of self-experiments and one thing he found was that as he ate more fat, you know, then his reaction time would get better. You know, so uh, the brain and nerves are mostly composed of fat, and as you eat more fat, uh, and the myelin sheets on our nerves are composed of lipids, and they're made from fat, and as you eat more fat, then you'll often get better neurological function, your brain will work better, your reaction time will get quicker, Yeah. but uh, you can have some negative effects on other parts of your body, and when, when you're overeating fat, uh, the excess of uh, calories get disposed of in muscle, uh, including the heart, and uh, and when you're disposing of an excess of fat, then you generate a lot of reactive oxygen species, and that can cause damage to the cells. And uh, Seth was sober eating fat, and he died of uh, of heart damage. Um, and you know, so there's there's risks on both sides, and uh, uh, you know, so it doesn't do you too much good to make your brain and nerves healthier if, if you end up uh, giving yourself a heart attack. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so it's important to eat a balanced diet. 
And so in, in our book, we look into, you know, what's the optimum. You know, so when we talk about fats, it's actually many different uh, nutrients. So there are many different kinds of fatty acid uh, that we can get. Uh, and there are also different lipids associated with them, like cholesterol, that are nourishing. And so there's a lot of different things you want to optimize. Mm, yeah. So it, it looks like is everything is coming back to, to balanced diet, that one has to find it for, for themselves. So we talked about there is no one diet fits all, so there are some you know, guidelines that they can follow and then tweak it for themselves, for their, their own optimums, and yep. follow, follow your guidelines in, in that, because those are great. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think you know a really good strategy would just be to follow our guidelines for a little while, uh, mm -hmm. and then follow your own taste preferences. You know, yeah. so just try tweaking things a little bit, and if something tastes better to you, uh, then eat it that way. And so, like we said, our brain evolved to make us healthy, and um, you know, so a part of being healthy, you know, I'd say the first step is you know use natural whole foods only. And then the second step is, you know, get close to optimal nutrition, you know, using our guidelines and eating our supplemental food recommendations and things like that. Uh, and then, uh, and then after that, uh, you know, follow your own innate taste preferences. So become a very mindful eater. You know, listen to your body. Did I really enjoy that food? Uh, did it feel right? You know, or do I feel like I'm getting too much of this? I I'm starting to lose my desire to eat this thing because I feel like I've had a lot of it, you know, then that's a good sign that you should cut that down and find something else that you enjoy more and eat, eat more of that. Yeah, uh, but it has to all happen within the realm of real food diet because like, you know, when people are switching to a paleo kind of diet, uh, what, I, what I tend to hear that, oh my gosh, I, I crave sweets and, you know, all those bad stuff. So it has to do with microbiome and with, you know, the gut yeah, function. Well, so it can be a little bit tricky sometimes to yeah, follow your Well, people your crave sweets because they're too low carb, mm. you know. So the solution to that is eat more starches. Um, if they eat more potatoes, then, uh, you know, usually the, the craving for sweets will go away. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you have to tweak it for yourself, <laughs> that's the baseline, and to try to make it balanced for yourself. So, and uh, we talked about, uh, like, supplemental foods, but uh, there is a whole huge part in your book talking about, specifically about uh, supplements. and. You know, you, you have a whole uh, long list of recommendations. So maybe if you could just mention the, the most important ones right now. Yeah. Well, um, so it's, it's really easy to be malnourished in the modern world. And, uh, and some of the changes uh, that have happened, you know, are really beneficial, but they have the effect of removing some nutrients from our food. Uh, you know, so for instance, water treatment. Uh, you know, which uh, water used to carry lots of germs and, you know, and people would get very sick. So it's much better that our water is now treated and it's clean. Uh, but in the process of treatment, they remove a lot of minerals. And so we're no longer getting a lot of water-soluble min minerals like magnesium and calcium in our water. Um, and, you know, so you can drink mineral water uh, to get uh, some of those back. Mm. You know, or you can just drink tap water and, and you can supplement uh, a little magnesium. You know, it's usually one of the most crucial ones. Uh, and then there, there are some other things that we recommend supplementing. Um, you know, some of them are things you could get from food, like, uh, say, vitamin C. Uh, you could eat a lot of sweet peppers. Uh, and, you know, those are rich in vitamin C. Uh, but, uh, you know, people don't like to eat a lot of food. And, uh, you know, but it's really important to get enough nutrition. And uh, so some things are really safe to supplement. And it's really easy to be deficient. And, you know, people don't really like eating the amount of food that they have to eat in order to be well nourished from food alone. Uh, you know, so you'd have to eat, uh, you know, something like uh, 500 grams a day of sweet peppers to really optimize mm -hmm. vitamin C status. Yeah. And, you know, most people just won't do that. And so uh, we recommend supplementing vitamin C. 
Um, you know, most people don't eat as much seafood as they should, so we recommend supplementing iodine. Uh, and that's also a safety thing. So if your iodine level is very stable, then you're much less likely to get uh, thyroid disease. Whereas if, if you don't eat any iodine for a month and then you have a really rich seafood meal, you know, then the big fluctuations of iodine content are more likely to cause trouble for you. Mm. Uh, and, uh, you know, so you can minimize disease risk by supplementing at a low dose of iodine. Um, and, uh, you know, and then there's vitamin D. Uh, you know, people, if you live at northern latitudes in Europe or uh, where we live in the northern United States, uh, when you go through the winter, it's really hard to get enough sunshine to make enough vitamin D, and so it's beneficial to supplement that. Yeah. Um, so there's there's a few things we recommend supplementing, um, and it's really you know it's about uh, you know first of all them being very safe to supplement uh, because they're non toxic in, in higher doses, and it's about it being very easy to be deficient. You know even if you're eating a good diet, uh, living in a healthful lifestyle. And so the risk reward, you know, really pays off to supplement them. Yeah, yeah, and, and you go you go really into get great details in your book about supplementation. So I really highly recommend people reading that, um, among, among the other parts, of course. So let's switch ge uh, gears here a little bit. Let's move from diet and nutrition to the lifestyle aspects of your protocol. So as we know, good health starts with f good food, but it's not only about food. So there are so much more to good health than just food. And uh, some of the most important aspects of health are actually pretty simple, and it's still so hard for people in modern life to implement into their habits. And one of them is sleeping, right? So why is sleep, sleep, sleeping so important, and how, what can we do to, to get more and better sleep for health? Well, uh, sleeping is, is really important, and in general, uh, circadian rhythm entrainment is, is really important. So it's really important for our health that uh, we live rhythmically. We have uh, a daytime uh, set of things that, should, that we should expose our bodies to, like sunlight, physical activity, exercise, uh, social interactions, um, and food are all things we should get in the daytime. And then in, in the nighttime, we should get uh, dim light, red-orange light, you know, think of a campfire um, or candlelight. Yeah. Uh, we should get, uh, we should be stress-free. Uh, there should be no stressful interactions. We should just be with people we love and are comfortable with. Uh, and we should get a good night's sleep. We should wake naturally, get enough sleep. Um, and, you know, all of these things are things that you know, we would naturally do in the Paleolithic. You know, before Thomas Edison invented the light bulb, uh, you know, it was really hard to expose ourselves to blue light at night. Yeah, and to iPads and <laughs> Yeah, that's and right. TV. And, you know, it was mm. really hard to stay up watching TV until midnight. Exactly. You know, or 1 a.m. Mm. And, uh, you know, but nowadays we've got, we've got televisions, we've got computers, we've got uh, automobiles, we can go meet people at night, um, we can do all kinds of daytime things at night, and it can easily disrupt uh, our health. And, uh, you know, we, we evolved, we were designed to have a 12-hour nighttime, you know, 12 hours of relaxation, you know, 8 hours of it sleeping, but, you know, 12 hours of relaxation, you know, no activity, no stress, uh, and our health really, uh, you know, can improve a lot if we give ourselves those uh, 12 hours. And in modern life, it's really hard to do that because everybody's got you know, 16 hours of daytime things they want to do every day. And uh, so it's really hard to carve out more time, uh, yeah. you know, not just for sleep, but also for uh, relaxation uh, before you sleep yeah. and after you sleep. Um, you know, so when, when you get up, you should wake naturally and you should still have, you know, a, a little, you know, an hour of relaxation uh, before you get really active. Uh, mm. And, you uh, you know, so most people just aren't getting enough relaxation time. Yeah, uh, for most people it sounds like utopia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, we have to be really conscious about, especially if we have some chronic issues that we have to 
yeah. resolve. Well, people can do a lot better, and, and at, at our retreats, we try to we try to teach uh, you know how how you can rearrange your schedule so you get some relaxing things uh, done in the evening. You know, so for example, you know, most people don't realize you can you can cook in the evening. You know, especially if you uh, have a pressure cooker mm. and you know an electronic pressure cooker, you can just put food in, you know, set the pressure cooker going, leave, uh, and it'll shut itself off, and, you know, you can have perfectly cooked food with hardly any stress, uh, and if you get the cooking done at night, you know, then you've saved a lot of time out of your day, so, uh, you know, and you don't need to eat food right after you cook it, you can, you know, mm -hmm. you can cook it and then save it either a day or two later, Yeah. and, so. uh, uh, you know, so there are little tricks you can do to, you know, move activities that, you know, are compatible with nighttime relaxation into the night and free up time in the day for your more stressful activities. Yeah, so you can use modern times uh, applications to to use uh, for, for live a paleo kind of lifestyle, which is... Yeah, amazing. that's right, that's yeah. right. So maybe one last thing I, I wanted to uh, talk to you today, and that is... Uh, this um, um, notion about uh, chronic infections. As far as I know, your upcoming talk on the Paleo Convention in Berlin, you are going to talk about these things, about like natural healing of chronic infections. So can you maybe give us a short intro about what your talk is going to be about in this regard? Yeah, well, um, you know, like I said, if in order to be healthy, the key thing you want to do is remove all the causes of disease. Yeah. And uh, and once you do that, then your body can heal itself. And you know, I'm I've been interested in chronic infections, you know, since I realized that you know I'd had them my whole life. You know, I mentioned I had them, you know, my first four years of life, uh, and then you know I eventually realized that I had you know several chronic infections causing my various health problems. Uh, and, uh, you know, fortunately was able to identify them and, and get over them. Um, and, uh, you know, and I think when you look at what are the major causes of disease, uh, you know, people tend to focus on things like genes, but really genes are not that uh, big a cause of ill health. Uh, you know, most genetic mutations people have make them more vulnerable to other bad things. You know, so if they're eating a bad diet, you know, then they're, you know, some people have worse health effects from it than others uh, because of their genes. But uh, if you're eating an optimal diet, uh, then uh, you probably have good health regardless of what your genes are. And, uh, you know, so genes are really, unless you're really unlucky, uh, your genes aren't really causing your diseases. It's much more often it's bad diet, uh, bad nutrition. Uh, an unhealthy lifestyle, or you have some kind of infections or a bad gut microbiome, so you're not being supported as you should be by beneficial uh, microbes in your gut. And, um, you know, and I think, you know, those are really the major causes of disease, and so if you optimize all of those things, if you uh, get rid of infections and uh, improve your microbiome, uh, and you implement all of the paleo ancestral type things like, uh, you know, like a, adopt our diet, uh, good nutrition, and adopt uh, an ancestral lifestyle, you know, then you, you really should recover. And so, uh, and for chronic infections, that's one place where you can make use of the medical community, you know, so they can help, help you diagnose uh, what you may have going on and can potentially help treat. Uh, mm -hmm. things. So, uh, you know, so it's really important to understand what can be potential causes of disease and how can you make use of the medical community to help yourself. Yeah. And uh, how, how about your, uh, your presentation on the Paleo Convention? So you are going to give us some practical steps uh, for like diagnosing and some tips. Yeah, that's how, right. So um, what to do about I mean, them and how... how right. We Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and we do this a lot at our health retreats. So I, I do pre-retreat health coaching for our guests. And, you know, we gather uh, medical data, the biomarkers that, you know, the doctors routinely order. And mm -hmm. we look at them for clues. And mm -hmm. we also look at the symptoms for clues. Mm -hmm. And you can often figure out what's going on uh, uh, in terms of, you know, people's infections. And everybody gets chronic infections. So they've... Uh, 
uh, you know, certain infections almost everybody gets. So, you know, like cytomegalovirus, uh, it's estimated that over 94% of the people in the world are infected. Yeah. Um, and then um, other things, you know, a lot of people don't have at birth. Uh, but they gradually acquire them over the course of a lifetime. And so there are many chronic infections, you know, that, uh, you know, the, uh, that are acquired about, you know, 1% of the people in the world acquire them each year of life. And so by the time you're 20 years old, about 20% of people are infected. By the time you're 50 years old, about 50% of people are infected. And by the time you're 80 years old, almost everybody's infected. And, mm. uh, um, you know, so, you know, most people will have dozens of infections by the time they're uh, uh, middle-aged. And, uh, and these things, you know, they become more and more of a burden and, uh, and can significantly impair your health uh, unless you've been supporting immune function yeah. with diet and lifestyle. Yeah, so this chronic infection sounds pretty scary, but at the same time, it's like an opportunity for us to like uncover these he healing opportunities. So uh, I'm sure you are going to uh, uh, tell like some strategies how to do that and what to do about them. So I highly encourage people coming to the to the event to hear more about this stuff. So yeah, it's going to be then, a really exciting event. So yeah. you know, if you're uh, if you have any way of getting to Berlin on July 25th, it's you know it'll it's it'll be really worthwhile. Yeah, I'm going to be there, and I hope um, many of our listeners are coming too. So, uh, where can listeners learn more about you and your work apart from coming to Berlin? <laughs> uh, well, they can go to our website, perfecthealthdiet.com. Mm -hmm. uh, they can uh, buy our book and. Uh, um, so we don't have a German edition yet. You, you mentioned we have a Hungarian edition, yes. and look, people can get it in English. And uh, you know, but hopefully we'll get a German edition before too long. Now that we're uh, doing more things in Germany. Yeah. Um, and uh, if people really want to get uh, engaged with us, they can come to our health retreat. So we have health retreats in May and October, uh, and it's in a, on a luxury property. We've got. Uh, we've got two heated saltwater pools, we've got uh, two saltwater hot tubs, we've got, uh, uh, you know, it's on a wonderful beach, and uh, the weather is terrific those times of year, and, uh, you know, and we complete, you know, we have a complete course on how to live a healthy life uh, with uh, movement classes, relaxation classes, science classes, so you know the reasons behind things, we have cooking classes, uh, great food. Uh, and uh, we do uh, also personal one-on-one -on -one health coaching yeah. uh, for all the guests. So it's a it's a really good experience. Yeah, sounds like a whole comprehensive package. <laughs> yeah, sounds yeah. very good. Okay, so Dr. Jamine Paul, thank you very much for coming to the show today and and for sharing so much with us. And I think our listeners are going to be very excited to learn even more from you and. So a very good opportunity, upcoming opportunity for that is to come to the Paleo Convention, which is, uh, as I mentioned, on the 25th of July. So it's going to be in Berlin, and we hope to see many of you listeners over there. So thank you very much, Paul, again. Yeah, thank you very my much, pleasure. Kevin. So that is our show for today. So please visit mywellnessworkshop.com for the show notes. I'm, I will be posting a summary of what we have just discussed here today, along with you know some links for resources and more information. So go over to mywellnessworkshop.com. And more of these expert interviews are actually coming on my show. So don't forget to sign up on my blog to never miss a show. So you will also receive a full transcript of this interview as well as my ebook about the six major root causes of, more chronic, uh, of the most chronic health problems and how to fix them naturally. So if you like what you've just heard today, come to see us personally at the Paleo Convention in Berlin and go get your tickets now at paleoconvention.de. So thank you for listening and hope to see you in Berlin and hope to share more with you soon. Bye.